Hello, fiendlings. How the hell are you? Are you enjoying this trip down Amnesia Lane? I hope so. I have a couple of announcements, and then we'll get into it. Earlier this year, I wrote and finished the first book in a trilogy that follows up the Derelict Saga. The first book, Neptune Scars, has been read by my patrons, and I've recorded about 20% of the audiobook. It was supposed to be published this month. My publisher and I couldn't come to terms for the new trilogy, and therefore Neptune Scars and the other remaining books of the trilogy have no publisher. While you might expect me to be heartbroken over this detail, I'm not. It's business, and while I didn't think it was a possibility, here we are. So what happens next? Putting out a book can get damned expensive. It requires professional editing, costing anywhere between $100 and $500, cover design and layout, another few hundred to a few thousand dollars depending on the service, and, of course, the stress and madness of making it all happen. In short, I hadn't budgeted for four books this year, only three. Therefore, Neptune Scars, Proxima Ghosts, and Reality Wars, working title, I promise, will have to be put aside while the Black Series gets the attention it requires. If anything, this will more than likely accelerate the delivery of the final three books in the series, making sure they're all published in 2024 or 2025. In other news, the Black Outbreak audiobook has finished production and should be available for pre-order quite soon. I'm rather excited to hear what Joe Hempel has done with my words and characters. I've also seen the trade paperback cover, the new ebook cover, and the audiobook cover. Scott Pond has once again outdone himself, and I can't wait to show you all that when it's time. But for now, let's get back to that Trey fellow and see what's going on in his world. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's Episode 3 of Closet Treats. Chapter 11 Just as on Friday, and most other days, the school parking lot was already filled with cars getting ready to pick up kids. Trey stared at the mostly empty bike racks, wondering once again why more of the kids didn't ride to school and back. If it wasn't for the fact Trey enjoyed walking Alan to and from school, he would have suggested they get the boy a bike. But that could wait. Middle school was only a couple of years away. By then, Alan would probably be ready to move on from this routine. Trey sighed. He knew that was inevitable, but it didn't make it any less painful to think about. Trey looked past the playground and through the copse of trees. Their cream-colored ice cream van sat parked at the curb. Its sliding door was still closed. From this distance, he couldn't make out any movement behind the tinted windows. The ice cream man was surely getting ready, making sure he had coins and bills for change and whatever else it was ice cream men did before serving the children. Scooby, Scooby, Scooby Doo, where are you? A phantom voice sang in his mind. Trey shivered. In his peripheral vision, he watched the woman a few feet away from him turn her head to look at him. He ignored her. Scooby, he thought. He fought away the jitters and stared at the school exit. Any moment now, the school bell's buzz would fill the world and children would start streaming through the glass doors. Alan would run out with them, but not quite be part of them. The thought of Alan's excited face made him smile. But the boy's lack of friends and the way he always stood apart from the other children made Trey feel a little sad, too. The teachers had said not to worry, that one day he'd find his place among the throng. Whenever he and Carolyn asked Alan about it, he just stared at them as if they were speaking Greek. The kid was too smart. Gets that from his mother, Trey thought to himself. The aloofness? That's all me, Trey sighed. His eyes wandered once again to the parked van. It bounced a little, as though someone inside was moving about. Trey smirked. Maybe Mr. Ice Cream Man is porking Mrs. Ice Cream, he thought to himself. The school bell buzzed, giving Trey a start. The two women waiting to walk their children home both sighed in relief, as though the wait had been excruciating. Trey tried not to glance toward them. He was certain they already thought him a closet pedophile or rapist or something. Jesus, didn't anyone talk to one another anymore? The glass doors opened, and as if on cue, the ice cream van's bells began to ring. Trey snapped his fingers. Do your ears hang low? That was the song. He tried so damn hard to remember its name, and there it was, just like that. The river of children swept through the doors, most heading toward the white van. Trey watched them, their packs slapping their backs in time with their frantic footsteps. Trey smiled and turned back toward the school. 
Alan walked out the door, his eyes finding Trey almost immediately. The boy smiled at him and quickened his pace. Trey wanted to wave at him, but he knew that wouldn't be the cool thing to do. He stood at the curb, the quiet, unobtrusive old fart. Well, you ready to go home? He said as Alan approached. The boy sighed. I guess so. I mean, I'd much rather stay here than play on the Wii. Trey shook his head and growled. No Wii until homework is done. Ah, Dad, Alan said in his best poor me voice. Sooner we get home, sooner I can get it done and play, right? Trey nodded. You got it, kiddo. He reached out and tousled the boy's hair. Let's do it. Yes, sir, Alan said. They made their way to the sidewalk in silence. Trey felt the jitters again. He didn't want to look at the ice cream van, but something glowed in his peripheral vision. Alan turned to look at the van. He sure has a lot of kids today, Alan said. Trey kept his eyes straight ahead. There is no closet man, he muttered. What, Daddy? Trey turned toward him and then stopped. His eyes riveted on the long arms that jetted from the van, taking money and handing back wrapped treats. Talons, not fingers. Talons attached to blasted, wretched, scaly flesh. He opened his mouth and then closed it. Daddy, Alan's voice said. He looked down at his son. Y yes? Alan shook his head and grabbed Trey's right hand. Come on, Daddy. The van doesn't like you. Trey nodded to him. Guess you're right. An another one? Just a little one, Alan said. They walked in silence down the sidewalk, Trey fighting the urge to look back over his shoulder. The thing, no, he scolded himself, the man in the ice cream truck was not the closet man. Scooby, Scooby, do. The childish voice sang in his mind. Shut up, Trey muttered. Alan said nothing back, just squeezed his father's hand a little tighter. Chapter 12 from the study, Trey listened to the sound of Alan reading his homework aloud in the living room. He smiled to himself. During school days, when Carolyn wasn't home and his son was in school, every minute was spent listening to music. While he coded, while he debugged, while he posted on forums and tracked down his shoes, every second was filled with the sounds of electronic beats mixed with guitars. He kept the left side of his brain asleep enough for the right side to work without interruption. But when Alan was home, Trey never listened to music. He knew it should have cut his productivity down, but it usually didn't. Just knowing the boy was in the other room was enough to put a smile on his face and keep him focused. Perhaps the music was merely there to reduce the loneliness. Trey didn't know, and didn't want to know. Like most things in his life, he was just happy they worked. As he went through the lines of code, his left brain woke up enough to let him know that Alan had stopped reading to himself. There was a new sound. Music. Bells. Trey shivered. He cocked his head to one side. The sound was growing louder. He and Alan had only been home for 40 minutes or so, but he'd already forgotten about the ice cream man. Until now. The bells. They were the same fucking bells. That voice, the phantom child voice, started to sing. Do your ears hang low? Do they wobble to and fro? The bells grew closer their steady shriek silencing the birds tweeting in the trees and blotting out all noise of traffic. Trey stood from his chair, his body racked with ice-cold goose pimples. Daddy? Alan asked. Trey nearly jumped and turned to face the boy. Alan's expression wasn't worried, so much as confused. Did the ice cream man follow us home? Trey gulped. Alan's expression turned fearful. You're spooking him, Trey thought to himself. With effort, he managed to false smile. No, Trey said, walking forward to the boy. He ran his hands through Alan's sandy blonde hair. He's just making the rounds. Trying to sell to all the kids in the neighborhood? Yes, Trey agreed. And some adults, I'm sure. Alan giggled. Good business sense, the boy said. Trey laughed. A real laugh, and his smile felt less wooden. Yes, it is. What made you say that? The boy bit his lip, a habit born of watching his mother for many years. We learned a little bit in class. 
Mrs. Smith said that if you run a business, you want to get as many customers as possible. Yes, Trey said, bending down to give the boy a hug. That's true. He realized the bells had grown loud enough that he had to raise his voice so Alan could hear him. Why don't you go back to reading? I'm going to go outside for a minute. Alan wrinkled his nose. To smoke? Trey felt a flush of embarrassment. Yes, and yes, I know it's bad for me. Alan shrugged and then hugged him. The boy walked back into the living room. Trey patted his front shirt pocket, making sure his smokes were still there. The pack's reassuring rectangle contours set his mind a little at ease. He had cut back significantly on his nicotine habit, rarely having more than a few cigarettes a week. Sometimes, when he was jonesing or felt nervous, he could just touch a pack of cigarettes and it would settle him. But this time, he knew he'd need the real thing. The taloned hands handing out treats flitted into his imagination. The yellow eyes, the burning crimson pupils. It was just an illusion, he said to himself. Just another psychotic delusion my brain played on me. He walked with trepidation to the front door. He paused for a moment, hand on the knob. I'll go outside, he thought, and watch it. Prove it. No boogeyman in the neighborhood. Just another working class guy trying to make some cash. He swiveled the doorknob and opened the door. The cacophonous bells were positively brain-numbing in volume. They were so loud, Trey wasn't sure he'd ever be able to hear again. The white van was at the street's entrance. He watched it travel down the other side of the block. It would hit the cul-de-sac, round it, and then travel back. He was sure of it. Trey deftly plucked the pack of cigarettes from his shirt pocket, opening by feel, and pulled one of the white cylinders out. Without looking at the pocket, he replaced the pack and retrieved the lighter in much the same way. This was a ritual for him, something he'd practiced in high school and in college. Before the, well, before the first incident, the routine had always provided that bit of focus. When he first started doing it, spending so much time practicing it, he didn't realize it was one of the first signs of his condition. He often imagined many other people did the same thing and that he wanted to be normal, just like them. Eyes still focused on the back of the white van as it made its way through the cul-de-sac, he lit the cigarette in the first try. He inhaled deeply as the van turned to face him. He stopped partway through his exhale. The van. The fucking van. The windshield was tinted? A shuddering hiss of air through his teeth brought the smoke out in a continuous, if jerky, stream. He shook his head as the van, the brilliantly white van, traveled closer. The bells had receded during his travel down the block, but the sound was now a rushing storm coming straight at him. His mind was barely aware that his neighbors were doing the same as he, stepping out onto their front porches to watch, to figure out what was going on. The windshield... A black cyclopean eye contrasting starkly against the van's white hood and face seemed to stare at him. The metal grill's steel grinned like a predator. Trey felt another wave of cold rise up his spine. That, that can't be legal, he muttered aloud. Tinted fucking windshield? The van was no more than 50 or so feet away, its body now visible. The first decal Trey saw stopped his heart in his chest. It was of a ghoul holding a bloody human heart in a taloned hand. The ghoul's smile grinned with ferocious yellowed teeth. Trey's scream locked in his throat. The second decal was an ice cream cone made of intestines and awful. A child's screaming severed head sat atop it, wild eyes just visible over the cone's lip. A single word was carved in blood just below the graphic. Yummy. Next to it, was what looked like a misshapen ice cream bar. Trey dropped the cigarette as he realized the ice cream treat was the blackened, burned body of a screaming child impaled through its backside by a long stake. As he watched, the screaming mouth began to move, the body wriggling on the stake. Trey stepped backwards, nearly tripping over the lip of the patio deck. The van passed by, heading toward the other cul-de-sac, the music still cheery and inviting. Trey took another step backwards, finally catching the deck's edge. He fell onto the deck, his ass hitting the wood with a thunk. The world spun around him, his vision unfocused and blurred. He heard a distant voice yelling, but he couldn't make out the words. When a hand touched his arm, he nearly screamed. 
Trey! His vision snapped back into focus. Dick sat on his knees in front of him. Hey, man, you okay? Trey looked up into the man's grizzled, bearded face. He marveled at the many white hairs tangled within the otherwise black beard. I... Trey struggled to speak and coughed instead. Dick grabbed his arm and pulled him up. Trey stood on rubbery legs, feeling as though he might fall down again at any second. Dick put his arms around his neck and took part of Trey's weight. I, I fell down, Trey managed. Yeah, Dick said. You did. The blasting music had receded, but now it was rising again. That shit is killing my ears, Dick said. He walked Trey toward the front door. Is your kid home? Dick asked over the den. Trey said nothing, nodding instead. God damn it, I'm going to kill that asshole, Dick said as he looked over his shoulder. Trey turned with him, once again facing the street. The van was passing them now. Trey took in a shuddering breath and stared at the dark passenger window. A pair of glowing yellow eyes stared back at him. Long white teeth glowed in the van's cabin. Trey's legs gave out again, but Dick was ready for him, taking his weight with a small grunt. Easy, Dick said, unaware of Trey's silent scream. Chapter 13 The bedroom was very dark. Trey flexed his fingers beneath the covers, playing the chromatic scale on an invisible trumpet. It was a relaxation technique from his teenage years. He couldn't possibly blow a decent tune on a horn now, but his fingers remembered the notes perfectly. He ignored the twinge of pain in his hand. He'd been tapping out the patterns for an hour. Through the bedroom door, he heard soft voices from the foyer. Dick and Carolyn were talking. He couldn't make out their conversation except for a few words. He concentrated on slowing his fingers, turning the chromatic scale in his head into a slow, winding progression of tones. Up from the low G all the way to high. He imagined the notes as ovals climbing the staff ladder. The front door squealed open and then closed. He listened to the light footfalls on the stairs. He smiled. It was Carolyn. Alan climbed stairs like there were an enemy to be defeated, his feet slam dancing on each step. But Carolyn's steps were always quiet, slow, methodical, especially at the end of the workday. Trey kept his eyes closed as the bedroom door opened and then closed softly. Her footfalls stopped at the bed's edge. He imagined her standing there, staring at him, wondering if he was sleeping. After a moment, she walked into the bathroom and closed the door. She changed out of her work clothes, neatly hang her skirt and suit jacket up. Then she'd roll off her stockings and hang them as well. Sweatpants, a sweatshirt, and slippers. That's what she'd be wearing when she stepped out of the bathroom. He waited. The bathroom door opened. Trey felt the bed's surface dip as she climbed in with him. He opened his eyes, feeling her naked skin against his own. A cool arm reached beneath his pillow as she snuggled up against him. Her breath tickled against his neck. Hi, baby, he whispered. She said nothing making a purring noise in her throat instead. They lay like that for some time until she rolled him onto his side, spooning against him beneath the warm comforter. Nothing like coming home to a warm, naked man beneath the sheets, she whispered. He grunted. Her free hand stroked his hair. I'm here when you want to talk, baby. Trey said nothing and closed his eyes. The warmth of her against his back soothed him. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to think about it. The anticonvulsant he'd taken was already making him feel sleepy and disconnected. In this state, there was very little that could bother him, but it was difficult to talk, much less string the thoughts together. They stayed like that for a while, her breath slowing, fingers tangled in his long hair. He knew she was dozing, and it made him smile. Alan would be downstairs, working on his math problems until he became hungry enough to knock on the door. Trey's son knew the routine. When Daddy had an episode, he was to be left alone, but Alan was to stay aware for any odd behavior and check on him occasionally until Mommy came home. The kid was remarkable. Trey smiled in the darkness. 
He felt his thoughts slowing, turning into an even flat line. Then he was asleep. Chapter 14 When he awoke, he felt cold. Carolyn's body was still pressed up against him in the darkness, but her skin was wrong. Her breathing was ragged, broken by soft grunts. Carolyn? Trey asked. There was no response other than a slight shift from beneath the pillow. Her fingers scratched against his scalp, the pain immediate and bright. Trey yelped and sidled away from her. He threw his head sideways to yell at her and then began to scream. An elongated face grinned at him, glistening canines yawning toward him in the room's darkness. Red rings danced in the center of its glowing yellow eyes. Its hand moved toward him, sharp talons ripping through the fabric of the bed. Trey screamed again and fell off the edge. He landed on his ass, his head smashing into the wall. The thing was slithering, moving toward him. He could hear its talons slashing through the bed sheets, the protest of threads as they parted in rips and shreds. Its breathing was louder now, a quick series of grunts and growls. Trey held his head in his hands and slammed sideways into the wall. Not real, he whispered. The grunts came closer, and he felt its hot sewer breath. You're not real, he screamed. The lights in the room flicked on. Trey? Carolyn asked. She knelt beside him on the floor. Trey, she whispered. He slowly pried his fingers open and looked through them at her face. Her blonde hair was tied in a ponytail, leaving a single long bang dangling down across her forehead. He dropped his hands from his face and stared at the bed. Whatever had been there was gone now. He looked up at her. I... She put her arms around him, and he shivered for a long time. Tears streaming down his face. Chapter 15 The cup of tea sat steaming on the edge of the kitchen table. Carolyn had heated up dinner for him. He normally plowed through her chipotle meatloaf, but tonight he ate it more out of obligation than hunger. You are going to call Kincaid in the morning? Trey looked up at her from the dinner plate. He felt like making a sarcastic remark, but decided against it. Yes, I, um, already sent an email. Carolyn smiled. You think the meds are off? He shrugged in response. I, I don't know. Dick's worried about you. With a grim chuckle, Trey lifted another forkful of the meal into his mouth. He chewed with mechanical determination and swallowed. That's because he knows there's a madman across the street. Stop that, Carolyn whispered. That's not it, and you know it. Trey dropped the fork and opened his mouth to talk. She held up a hand. Trey? Dick said something about an ice cream van. Trey nodded and began to speak. She held her hand up again. Just listen, okay? Trey shrugged and reached for the cup of chai. Dick said its windows are tinted. Trey nodded. You saw something. Trey nodded again. She leaned forward and placed a hand on top of his. She squeezed as she looked in his eyes. Dick said the van made him feel... uneasy. Trey's eyes widened. He felt it too? He asked in a whisper. Carolyn smiled. Yes, Trey, he did. I know I'm crazy, brain chemistry all fucked up and all that. He dropped his eyes to her hand. But I never had a delusion like that. Never. What did you see? The image of the ghoul, the thing's elongated face, its fierce glowing eyes, the long sharp teeth glistening with blood and half-chewed flesh rose into his mind. He shuddered. Don't want to talk about it, baby. She nodded. Okay. Is Alan... His voice dropped a sentence as soon as he began to speak the words. Alan. Fucking Alan. he completely come unhinged in front of his son. He knew his screams had scared the boy. How could they not? 
Carolyn smiled at him. Ellen's okay, Trey. He knows that Daddy had a daymare and then a really bad nightmare. Trey continued staring at her hand. The hand rose, the fingers spreading beneath his chin. She lifted until his eyes met hers. Alan's okay. He's okay. A single tear appeared in the corner of Trey's eye. He wiped at it. He's such a bright kid, and I'm fucking him up one day at a time. She rose from her seat and stood behind him. Her fingers worked into the knots in his shoulders, gently brushing at first and then digging into the muscles. Pain ripped through his back. He tried to relax, flexing his fingers in the chromatic scale. The knots in his shoulders slowly dissolved, the pain dissipating into pleasure. Her arms wrapped loosely about his neck as she kissed his cheek. You're not fucking him up, Trey. You're not. She kissed him again. He loves his father, and he understands. Another kiss. Just like I do, she whispered. Trey tried not to weep. Take me upstairs, he said softly. I think I can sleep. No, you can't, she said softly into his ear. She gently bit at his earlobe. He moaned. You have some work to do first. She kissed the hollow of his neck. Then I'll let you sleep. <laughs>